Hello everybody, what is up? It is Cyborg here with another video, and today I decided to do a video on kind of the introduction to game hacking, going over a lot of things that people don't go over. So yeah, let's get started. I want to give a shout out to Ice Venom, Morgan, and Null for helping make this PowerPoint. So one thing I want to say is this PowerPoint can become outdated very fast, so can the video. So I recommend going and checking the PowerPoint down in the description and downloading it. It's there I'll be able to update it and fix any errors that I say. Now first things first, we're going to find out how memory is stored and how to find out where it is stored. That's kind of a ambiguous name, but I'll go over that more in detail. Now first things first is addresses, offsets, and pointers. This is one of the basic things for game hacking, and a lot of people don't fully understand this. Now to understand addresses, I'm going to give you kind of an example. So imagine a mailman is delivering a package to a house he gets the address and he delivers the package to the house and that's all good and sometimes you can just use addresses and you don't need offset but other times you need offsets to find the value so now let's put a situation where this mailman needs to deliver a package to an apartment building he goes to the address of the apartment building and then they need the offset of what apartment to deliver the package to and that's where the offset comes in hand you go to the address and then after the address you jump to the offset and now do keep in mind that sometimes there can be up to five or more offsets and there's not always just one offset depending on the game so you might have to go to another offset after you get to that offset and so on and so forth i recommend reading this whole entire thing because i explained it a lot more in detail now a pointer is kind of like the final route for the apartment that all of it points to and now a chain in essence is a lot of pointers working together in a chain to get a value of something and a chains are kind of more of a coding thing but it is necessary to know because a lot of people refer to them now let's keep in mind that addresses and offsets are stored in hexadecimal also called hex and this is kind of like a human uh, friendly way to represent binary uh, values for for languages such as the C family also you'll use 0x and that 0x is like a declaration to declare that the value after the 0x is going to be hexadecimal. Now there's a lot of applications to reverse engineer programs memory. One of the most famous ones is Chi Engine and this is due to like the ease of scanning. You can very easily scan the process. I have a lot of tutorials on Cheat Engine. I recommend you check them out if you don't know Cheat Engine but for this tutorial video we're not going to go over Cheat Engine just because that takes so long. And now there is other people use these is kind of more advanced such as IDA and all debug. Um, there's honestly so many programs to um, here. I recommend just using Google if you don't understand anything or DuckDuckGo. I recommend that more because um, Google sells your information to advertisers. Now examples of a pointer path, like we mentioned before the definition of a pointer is the path which all of this points to. So first we have the game. So we get the game handle and we add our base address, our address, and we add that and we get the result. And then for this example, we have two offsets. Like I said, you won't always need offsets, but this example we have two. So we get the result of this right here. We add our first offset. We get the result of that. And then we add our next offset. And here is the hexadecimal value at which it points to. All right. Now, coding language is used to make hacks. That name is kind of self-explanatory, so let's get into it. Now, first thing first, you need a, a development environment and to develop your code. Now, the development environment I recommend is Visual Studios, some IDE. Um, Visual Studio, short for VS, is an integrated development environment where most coders and hackers develop their cheats. This is primarily due to the ease of use, compiles, compile errors, and IntelliSense, which is real-time error checking and autocomplete, flexibility and functionality. So if you have your own IDE, you can still use it, but if you're starting off, I'd recommend Visual Studio's IDE. And don't mess up Visual Studio's IDE with Visual Studio's code, they're two different things. All right, coding language is used for hacking. Now, it is recommended that you know at least the basics of coding. Um, if you don't know the basics of coding, like loops and all that, I mean, you learn it. And this is because we're gonna be doing a lot of, like a lot of game hacking is coding while the other part is reverse engineering. If you don't fully understand coding, you're gonna be struggling a lot. Now, you can hack in almost any game as long as it's a low level language. Now, what is a low level language? It's a language that is very low level. And not as low level, I don't mean easy. I mean it's close to the processor, so you have a easy use of communicating with the hardware and operating system of the PC. And languages such as Python, Node.js, they're pretty high level languages. So to communicate with things such as the processor, um, like hardware of the PC is very difficult. So I really recommend it because you're gonna have a lot of toil. Now why the C family of languages is most prevalent in game hacking? 
Now the C family of languages first off is C++, C Sharp, it's so much. There's so much in the C family of languages, but these are the three main. And these are the most common because they're low level. The way they're designed is very low level, giving us easy access to the system's low level resources, and it doesn't require a lot of external dependence. Now, I'd recommend a journal coding book for beginners, and then once you know the basics of coding, I'd recommend you start to get into C++. C++ is also called CPP. The P's stand for pluses, coding applications that access the game's memory. All right, first things first, there's external, kernel, internal. Um, what these are, these are kind of like the three main types of hacking genres. And external is .exe file, an executable file located in the user land slash mode, and it's ring three. If you don't understand what I just said right here, I'll go over that more on the next slide. And to use an ex uh, external, you need to open a handle to the process to access the memory. Now kernel, this kind of falls under the external, but we're going to refer to it as own just due to the large differences. This is located in the kernel land slash mode, and it is ring zero. And like I said, I'm going to explain this right here in the next slide. And you only need a PID, short for process ID, to access the memory of the process. Uh, now internal. An internal is typically a .edll file that is injected inside of the game's process, uh, where there it manually modifies the code. You do not need to open a handle most of the time for this to access memory. And now a little note down here, both internal and external have their own benefits when it comes to different anti-cheats, though most modern anti-cheats do detect both. All right, the rings of privilege, like I mentioned before, have ring three and ring zero. These are the two main ones that you'll be dealing with. Uh, ring one and two are generally ignored just due to them not being useful. Now, ring three, this is also called user mode slash lan, and this is due to the privilege it's located in. What I mean by that is it's in the user mode, so it's located in the area of the user. I hope that makes sense. And this is most of the time, you know, just simple applications such as games, uh, .exes, and .dlls. And this is one of the least privileged uh, rings due to the drivers having more privilege over it. You can see right here, ring 3 is on the outside, and all of these have more power than it. Ring 0, this is also called kernel mode slash land, and this is due to the area it has privilege over. Now ring 0 has privilege over all of this stuff below it. It's the most privileged and powerful thing on your PC. It has control over all the rings below it, like I said. And ring 0 hacks can be detected by... Uh, anti-cheats that detect kernel drivers and I'll go over that more in the anti-cheat and bypasses section. Alright, getting the PID, short for process ID. Each process running in the Windows P, uh, PC operating system is allocated a unique identifier which it is then executed. Now this identifier can be up to five uh, numbers long and you might see these identifiers in Task Manager. So how do you get the PID? To get the process ID for C++ you can take a snapshot and this uses the function create tool help 32 snapshot. You pass the parameter th32cs underscore snap process flag as only parameter and this returns a handle to the snapshot of all the running processes so then you can enumerate to find the process you are looking for. So you get all the processes running on your PC and then you use the function process32 next and by doing a str compare function on the name of the process to check if it's the right one once the process is found, you can then find the PID by accessing the TH32 process ID member of the process um, century32 struct. With the PID, you can now open the process. Now, what I just said, that was definitely very complicated, and there's a lot of functions that you may not have understood right there, and it'd be definitely hard to go over all this, but a good resource is MSDN, Microsoft's kind of built-in documentation. So I'll have a link right here that you can click on. All right. So next things next, opening a handle to a process. In order to access the memory of another process, we have to open a handle. And a handle to a process can be opened using the Microsoft function open process. So open process is a function that is included in the Windows H header, which is an external dependency. And it's a standard file which comes like with the Windows operating system, so you shouldn't have to download anything. This means that you can use open process, and open process takes uh, several parameters, and these parameters are this, the desired access. So the desired access parameter I go over on the next slide, the, uh, the, the inherit handle, and the process ID, which we got on the last side. Now upon completion, we will get two different values depending on if it's needed or not. It'll return an open handle to the desired process, as if we failed, it'll just return a value of null. And you can get info on this using the get last error function. All right, process access rights. This is what we will input right here for the desired access. Now there's three process access rights that we use, process all access, process read, and process write. Now let's start with the bottom process write. So this is if you wanna write memory. So you take memory and you write 
edit process read this is if you just want to read the value of something and then process all access is if you want to do both of these now reading memory of a process so for externals we use the read process memory function and like most of this it's located in the external dependency windows.h and now read process memory like the open process function also takes several parameters which are the h process the handle to the process which we got in the last slide so it takes the base address the base address I talked about in verse engineering slide, the buffer size, the int size, the size of the value of which we're reading. So say you wanted to read the value of an int, you'd put the int in there, the number by thread, which is usually kept at zero. Attribute called the read process memory function returns one of two values, which isn't zero if it succeeds or zero function fails. Now writing to the memory of a process is the same or very similar to the reading process but um, there are some different and the distinction of LP number of bytes written is exposed to LP number of bytes read. If left null this uh, will simply be ignored and most of the times this is left null. LP buffer contains the data you wish to write to the memory. The function with either re return uh, non-zero if it succeeds or zero if it fails. Closing the handle to the process. Now this is necessary and it's a very good practice. Whatever you open you have to close logically. So we used the open process handle before now we're going to be using the closed process handle. Now the closed process handle is simple to do. You do close process and the only value that it takes in is the object handle. So you'll just put in the object handle in the parameters and it's a good practice especially if you're trying to remain undetected. And now going into being undetected and all of that, anti-cheats and bypasses. Now this is going to be the hardest part. I recommend learning the basics of all coding and all that first before you get into that and getting confident because it's a very confusing part in game hack. Now anti-cheats. There's three main anti-cheats in the arena that people talk about. BattleEye, EAC, Easy Anti-Cheat, or VAC, Valve Anti-Cheat. Game developers use these companies or they make their own or they make their own to secure their games and prevent unauthorized access to process memories. ACs is going to be short for anti-cheats, not air conditioners. Keep that in mind. And they have their own strengths and weaknesses, each one. Like BattleEye might be better at detecting kernel, while VAC is just trash in general. One anti-cheat might be better than the others. And just a side note, VAC really isn't that good. So if you want to get started on hacking and bypassing anti-cheats, I'd recommend starting with VAC first. Ring zero and anti-cheats complex relationship. So Ring zero, also known as kernel mode slash land, and ring zero is kind of weird. So not all anti-cheats can detect kernel hacks or are good at detecting kernel hacks. ACs update your clients to detect these types of hacks, and an AC must have a kernel driver to detect a kernel driver. Very logical, so you have to have a kernel driver that the anti-cheat uses to detect a kernel driver in kernel land. And for example, BattleEye has their own kernel driver that goes by the name of BEDAISY.SYS, and it detects suspicious kernel drivers trying to communicate with their games, kernel space, and stops them. They also block methods of faking signatures and hijacking. And now for Ring 3, also known as user mode applications, um, this requires their own unique bypass and exist in the user land only. Bypasses for uh, user mode are really unique and interesting as of you know bypasses are typically not discussed publicly and they have to be very unique and by that I mean that there isn't really like a general bypass you know people make their own and there's not enough time to go over all the ones that people made but bypasses require a lot of work and you have to be smart about it and very creative. You cannot copy and paste a bypass at all most of the time be detected or to be detected within a few weeks. So you need to use your mind to be able to make these. 99% of the bypasses uh, publicly posted will be detected. I recommend going on GitHub to learn about bypasses. Just search phrases like kernel bypass, injection bypass, and try to learn from the code to make your own. The internet's a great resource. You can search up, you know, detection vectors these different anti-cheats use and just try to learn as much as you can. Anyways, that's going to be it for this video. I hope you did enjoy it. I hope you learned something. And anyways, peace out out.